Well, I'm, uh, I'm pleased to be joined here by Ms. Bonnie Stite, who was the former director of cyber intelligence at the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, we've heard a lot about artificial intelligence, large language learning models. What we want to do really is talk about it within the context of security and privacy. Now, you've obviously had a very long and illustrious career in the intelligence agency. What are some of the key takeaways that regular organizations, when just looking from a security standpoint, right, if we zoom out for a moment and just look at security, what are some of the key takeaways and learnings that you can yeah. bring to the, to the market that normal organizations can apply? That's great. You know, Nima, we've talked about this before, and what I would say is don't underestimate the ability of your adversary to surprise you. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in having a plan A, plan B, plan C, and I, I think that's something to keep in mind as we go forward. Um, time is always on the side of the attacker. It's not on the side of the defender. And so the best you know, offense you're going to have is a good defense as you go forward. You know, as we said, the unfortunate events of you know, two weeks ago right. really you know, kind of demonstrate it doesn't matter how well you've got it wired, um, they can still get past your defenses. And so I think there's, there's a thoughtfulness to go into that. Mm -hmm. but, um, but a good recovery plan is going to be, I think, essential to everything in this space. Excellent. Now, if we take that same lens of looking at cybersecurity in general, and now we layer on top, right, this introduction of generative AI, right, where you have all these different applications starting to come to the market. A big topic, and we've heard it a little bit throughout the day, but something that comes to the top of my mind, and I think something that plays at the top of your mind, is around governance and privacy. We've seen, for example, over this past year, the European Union come out with a set of guidelines around the use of generative artificial intelligence in public spaces or in the workspace. As you look back again, I mean, I'm, I'm imagining you've probably worked with and dealt with some really, really fascinating technologies over your career. When you look at governance and privacy as it pertains to AI, what are some of the things that come to mind? How, how, how should we be thinking about the governance and privacy aspect of this? You know, I thought it was, <clears throat> in watching the, um, the keynote speakers today where they were breaking down the difference between public, um, private, and personal, I was really concerned, that, that's where my concern is, mm -hmm. is that the lines get really blurry, particularly with a generation that likes to put everything in the public space, and I'm not sure that, that they're as aware of the, the hazards of being out there as maybe some others might be that are in the security space. <clears throat> but I think what we can't do is think that we're going to fight it. Um, you know, as we saw during the pandemic, the organizations that thrived were the ones that figured out how to reinvent themselves in a new space. AI is a new space. You either reinvent yourself in that space or you become obsolete because it's going to be the, the predominant space. <clears throat> you know, we were talking about, um, I mean, I hearken back to a book that was written years ago called Future Shock by Alvin Toffler, where he kind of hypothesized that humans would become obsolete with the computerization and the, the technology that was going on. But I think what we're seeing, even in cybersecurity, if you think about it, is not enough humans. And so all of this is going to create more work and we're going to have greater need for more education and governance to help, you know, I think monitor and certainly set the standards for what's going to go on in this space. So, um, so I'm, I think I'm more concerned about how we educate so that we don't blur the lines between what is public, what is private, and what is personal because there's a lot of people that think everything is public and, um, and I think the companies that allow that kind of thing to go on um, without better education are going to be in peril of having some of their data and, and their intellectual property, which is already under attack in so many places, um, as part of the new, you know, right. Gen AI yeah. kind of content that is coming out, and it might not be where you want it to be when it happens. So uh, that does concern me a great deal. So on the governance front, it sounds like a little bit. It's, it's it sounds like it's a mix of the two, right? It's a people aspect of it and a technology aspect of it. As organizations are looking at, you know, the different use cases for AI and generative AI, especially from a governance and privacy standpoint. You know, technology ultimately, I believe, is supposed to be an enabler to business, right? Even security, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, let me go and invest, you know, millions of dollars in cybersecurity just because I have millions of dollars to burn, right? It's, you're trying to drive forward the mission of your organization, right? Absolutely. So, you know, you were trying to drive forward the mission of your agency. Our organizations, our customers are trying to drive forward the mission of their organizations. How do you approach that from the standpoint of 
getting the business stakeholders bought in, right? I'm sure not yeah. everybody who you had to get buy-in from was as a deep and expert subject matter expert as you were when it came to cyber intelligence. What's the, what are some of the lessons that you learned in terms of aligning and building that internal mind share? Yeah, I think it's really important to understand that, that this whole AI actually increases the attack space in my mind. I mean, there's more out there that can be aggregated together now in a way that makes your company much more vulnerable to, um, to somebody that really wants to get in there. But I, I think the bigger piece of it is, um, you know, have some sort of an education model in place for your organization. The fact of the matter is you can't stop this from happening, but what you can do is create a model that educates people on, on what's there. You know, what is the most important thing that you need to keep out of the public sphere? Help yourself keep your stuff secure. I think, um, you know, you've got to prioritize what needs to be secured and put the, put the methods in place to do that. Yeah. But the other part of it is, I, I can't emphasize the education piece enough. I mean, your people are your first line of defense. And if they're not educated on what's going on, then you have no defense. So just handing it over to the security people and saying, here you go, go at it, isn't going to be enough. The other part of it is, um, I'm on a couple of boards where we educate the board on cybersecurity. So, you know, as I explained to you, I'm, I'm, I go to a health system in Kentucky that was breached in May, and they're still trying to figure out how to recover from this. Um, on a, another board, we did, a, we did a tabletop exercise with the board members to help educate them on what they need to be paying attention to in this space. What's your plan B? What's your plan C? Right. What is your recovery plan? Do you have a business continuity plan? Do you have a disaster recovery plan? Where's your data stored? You know, the idea that you could just, you know, have it all in the cloud someplace at a different place, I think has gone away. And so how can you use AI to help you recover in this space? Because I think that's a big possibility without, you know, without right. getting too much in the technology of it. But I think there's a lot of opportunity in this space to, um, to really build up your organization on the security side with this as well. And I, and I think that that's a good segue to, I guess, we you know, when we talk about the security organization, again, a lot of times, you know, security is kind of the, you know, the, the, the double-edged sword in an organization where they're seen as the protectors or the defenders of the organization, but they're also viewed as, they're the people that always tell me no. I can't do something yeah. or, you know, driving poor usability because I've got to go through, you know, multi-factor authentication and I got to reset my password and all of these various things. But as we look at, you know, what you were saying in terms of this marriage between your security professionals and the business stakeholders, especially now when we layer in a technology like generative AI, I mean, I guess the first part of that question is, you know, we've heard comments that, you know, GAI is going to be like the, the industrial revolution. It's going to completely change everything and every construct that we have. I'd first like to get your point of view on that in terms of, you know, how impactful is GAI from a security standpoint? And then how has it shifted what success looks like for the CISO or the CIO, right? Has it shifted those metrics for that person? Well, I think it's, it's shifted the complexity of the work mm -hmm. that they're going to have to do. So, I mean, Gen AI is, you know, I mean, it's, it's taking from data that's out there. So it's going to pull from good and it's going to pull from bad. You're still going to need to validate your data. It's, you know, unless you believe everything you see on the internet, which, you know, go forward and conquer. Um, yeah. It's not kind of my space, but I know people that do. So there's still a validation piece that's got to be in place mm -hmm. there. And um, from the CISO perspective, I think, or from the security perspective, it's really going to be looking at what is being, you know, what, what's showing up, and then how you factor in this into your overall security program. It's, there's no silver bullet to any of this. It's, it's going to be knowledge, and validation and all of the things that we've done already, right? Yeah. So there is no security program that makes any user's life easier. I mean, that's the reality of it. So, um, so and if you're in the security world, I mean, I'm sorry if I'm saying that to you, but, but that's the reality of it. When you load something on to secure your computer, it doesn't make any user's life easier. It just adds more complexity to the mission. I think a big piece for me, though, is, is just remembering that if you say no to somebody, their requirement didn't go away. Mm. So now they've got to figure out how to get around your no to get to where they need to go. And so I think AI might help you get to an easier yes sometimes. And so maybe there's a the piece of it, the Gen AI piece that, that can be used to help accomplish a mission um, rather than saying no and thinking that you solved your problem walking away um, and you're leaving it open to somebody's good idea to get around your no. 
because I, I think that's a bigger piece that we're going to worry about. Because if you're not using it to help them, they're going to use it to help them. And so, um, so I, I think you've got to be really informed in that space. So if you were walking in tomorrow into an organization to consult their CISO or their mm -hmm. CIO, or let's say you took a, a, a new role as a CISO tomorrow, you know, the, everybody in every business unit in the organization is talking about, we're going to roll out large language learning models and we want to use AI for this and AI for that. How would you be looking at that uh, as kind of your, your new remit in terms of how you put, some, put your arms around that? You know, the governance and, 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 and just, you know, how would you be thinking about that from, from a, a security leader standpoint? I think you'd be working 24 hour days for a while. <laughs> um, I think the bigger piece of it is, have, is building an understanding around what is public data that's being built into this model? Yeah. What is the private data and then what is the personal data? I mean, I, I think that's the first piece you've got to get your hands around. Right. Because, you know, in, in the security world, there's this strange thing that happens is you can put unclassified data with classified data and it doesn't make it classified, it actually unclassifies all of it. Mm. Because people don't know anymore what is and isn't. And so you've got to help establish some sort of operating procedures within that data space so that people understand this is data that doesn't ever get shared, this is data that can be shared, and this is data that's for your personal use. And so, you know, if you want to put your personal life out there, but putting your personal life out there, as we talked about, right. really leads to like great social engineering to get into your data. So, um, so educating about what is going out with all of this personal information. So there's a, there's a recurring theme I'm hearing from you here uh, around, you know, marrying the technology with the people and processes. Absolutely. It sounds like that to a large extent, in order for us to be able to move forward and truly leverage the benefits and the use cases around AI, you're really going to have to upskill people. You're going to have to have the types of processes in place. And I think that goes back to an earlier comment you made, right, around not having the, enough people or the right people. Because one of the things that we hear a lot about is, well, AI is going to put everybody out of, out of a job. But it doesn't sound like that that's where, you're, where, where you look at it. Well, I mean, when's the last time you had meaningful interaction with a bot, okay? <laughs> I mean, I actually had Siri tell me to be nicer one time, which just totally blew my mind. I was like, wait, what? So. Um, yeah. There, there's going to be a need for people in this space because what we've seen is, you know, how many of you have got a fully a full staff of people now working for you and you have no vacancies in any of your jobs? I mean, is there anybody out there that's fully, fully staffed, no vacancies? What, what happened to all this technology that was gonna make all those vacancies you know, go away and you weren't gonna need people anymore? It didn't happen. And AI is not going to create that space for us either. It's actually going to make it more complex, and we're still going to need people in a space that understand what's going on to help us marry the technology with the humans. There's no obsolescence coming for humans in the space that I can see. Yeah. So I think there's more necessity. And in the cybersecurity space, we're real concerned about the lack of humans. Yeah, I, I know. I know in security, right? I mean, we've we've all seen the statistics around the numbers of job openings or the lack of talent or skilled talent, right? It's one thing to have a lack of talent; it's nothing to have the the right types of skill sets. But as we look forward, right, just from an, from a generative AI standpoint, again, you know, I'll go back to you know, you you've had an amazing career working with technologies that I don't think any of us could even imagine that exist or are out there. Maybe some of them we start to see some of these applications on. But what excites you the most about? you know, everything that's going on with generative AI and large language learning models. What are you, what are you most hopeful about around its applications? I think I'm hopeful for the human race. I mean, our ability to solve harder and harder problems. I mean, when you think about, I mean, this incredible social experiment that we just went through with the pandemic. I mean, how many of you thought that we would get a vaccine in as short a period of time as we did? And, you know, and is it 100% effective? No. But you know what, but it's better than nothing, frankly, because the first round took the weakest, the second round came after the next round. So, I mean, we just keep going through this COVID experiment over and over, but I think the ability to, to marry the technology with human ingenuity is gonna create a better space for all of us in ways that we can't yet even imagine. Because I mean, for those of us, I mean, I learned to type on a manual typewriter. My dad said, if you know how to type, you'll always have a job. And now, who types? Right. I mean, you either keyboard or you dictate. I don't, I mean, I like dictating a whole lot better than I like keyboarding. So, um, so, and yet, my job has not gone away. Yeah. 
No, it's, it's uh, again, I mean, I think from my standpoint, I, I, I think the use cases are, are fascinating, right? I mean, you, I remember you and I had a conversation about just even like in healthcare, right? You sit on the board of a number of healthcare systems um, and just in terms of being able to not be limited to, let's say, getting the best care in your city or your county or your state, yeah. but being able to pull in that subject matter expertise and that knowledge from a, from a global standpoint, yeah. which again, obviously you have some, some security and, and privacy and governance ramifications around there that we've spoken about. I'd say, you know, just to, to, to finish off, you know, what would you leave people with? You know, what would be the, kind of your closing message as, you know, we've, from a technology standpoint or technologist standpoint, this year has been dominated by AI, right? I mean, it, chat GPT came out and overnight it was the topic of every conversation, every social yeah. media post. As we go into 2024, what would you leave people with in terms of you know, how to look at the next 12 months? I mean, I know, and again, you and I have even talked about this in terms of trying to predict the future, right? Nobody can predict the future. Nobody has any idea. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, a, an exercise in, 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 in you know, uh, wasted effort, but at least for the next 12 months, what, what would you, how would you be looking at the space in terms of organizations starting to get onto or develop those use cases within the context of, of governance? Yeah. You know, I'd look at where you've got shortages and start building use cases for AI, to be perfectly honest with you. Because if you can't, you can't clone people, well, maybe you can't, but not fast. But if you've got a shortage in your workspace, it might be an opportunity to look at an AI application to help you overcome that shortage. I mean, I'm excited. I think we're actually at the beginning of the beginning. I don't think we're at the beginning of the end, um, but then I tend to have a much more Pollyanna view of the world anyway. So I think it's exciting. The opportunity to be able to do more faster excites me yeah. because I'm a big believer, like I hate waiting. I want it to happen and I want it to happen now. So I think this gives us the opportunity to look for those gaps that we've got, figure out how AI can help us with the gaps and then move forward even more quickly with the things that we've got to solve because there's some hard problems out there that we're working on. And so I encourage you guys to, to, you know, to think out of the box on this in a big way. Oh, that, that's great, thank you, Bonnie. So um, again, thank you very much for, for joining us today at Tech Thanks World. Thank you for uh, making the trip out here. Absolutely. It's uh, you know, a, a great personal coup to get you out here. I know you're very busy, so yeah. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.